Today, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, the former Foreign Minister and First Lady of Somaliland, Edna Adan. The seeds of Ms. Adan's success and determination were sown early, when she was growing up as the daughter of a Somali medical doctor in Hargeisa. At the age of 15, she enrolled as a student and later worked as a teacher at a girls' school in Somaliland. There, she was awarded one of a few coveted scholarships to study in Great Britain, where she spent seven years studying nursing, midwifery, and hospital management. When she returned home, she became the first qualified nurse midwife in Somaliland and the first Somali woman to drive a car. But that was only the beginning. Ms. Adan had a dream, a dream of building a hospital devoted to the care of women and mothers in Somalia. Unfortunately, this dream would have to wait for the end of the Somali Civil War, which began in the mid-1980s, and forced her to flee her country. While she was living abroad, the World Health Organization recruited her to serve in various positions. She was an advocate for the abolition of female genital cutting. She trained midwives and traditional birth attendants in 22 countries. And from 1991 to 1997, she served as the World Health Organization's representative in Djibouti. But all the while, the dream lived on. When Ms. Adan was finally able to return to her homeland, she sold all of her possessions to purchase the only location available for a hospital in Hargeisa. Thanks to her dedication and that of her staff, the Edna Adan University Teaching Hospital was officially opened in March 2002. And it has It has cut the maternal mortality rate of its patients to one-fourth of the national average. And today, she continues to live her dream as she works to bring medical care to all of Somaliland. And two years ago, Ms. Adan opened Edna Adan University. Ed Edna Adan's achievements are a testament to what courage, determination, hard work, and a deep and abiding belief in social change can truly accomplish. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Edna Adan. Thank you. President Jonathan Kaplan, President of Walden University, Professor Bernie and Rita Turner, who founded this great university, Chief Academic Officer Eric Rydell, Honorable Director of the Board, headed by Paula Singer, Proud parents, friends, children, grandchildren of the graduates, and of course, the graduates themselves. Good morning or good afternoon. <laughs> it's a, such a privilege to be here with you today and to celebrate with you your big day, proof of your accomplishments. And although it took me over two days to get here from Somaliland, I am proud to deliver this commencement speech to over a thousand graduates who are here with us today, as well as the broader family of Walden University, where another 6,000 are graduating. And I believe graduates come from over 98 countries in the world it makes me so proud. Thank you, Walden University, for giving me this great honor. Now, let me start by congratulating you, 
on your successes as well as your achievements. Because without that, you would not be here today. But also allow me to inspire you and to uh, address you so that you may look into the future and see how you can solve some of the problems of your community around the world, because that is what you studied so hard for. Hopefully, you will be motivated to put to practice all the ideas and strategies you have learned from Walden University. That is where you must excel. That is the proof of your accomplishments. You owe it to yourselves, and you owe it to your community. Let me also share with you some of the opportunities that I have had, but also some of the many obstacles I've had to face, to face in my lifetime to get to where I am today. I will begin with my schooling, because most likely many of you come from countries where there are schools. It's only natural to send your child to school. And most probably the governments of your countries sponsor schools to give every child in your country an opportunity to learn to read and write. In the real world, there are countries where even when there are schools, education is not within the reach of every child. In a few countries, education may even be considered un unacceptable and, un and undesirable for some of them, and particularly for girls. I cannot think of a better example than that of Malala, who risked her life in order to get an education, and who recently was awarded a very well-deserved Nobel Peace Prize. As a child, I too faced that obstacle, because I was born in a country, British Somaliland Protectorate, where there was simply no, girl, no school for girls. In fact, teaching a girl to read and write was considered to be unwise. And people believed that nothing good could come of teaching a girl to read and write. Let her stay at home, learn to cook, prepare herself to become a wife, instead of wasting time to read and write like boys. Now, fortunately, I was blessed to have a father who believed in education. Someone who was known as the father of healthcare in my country, and someone who continues to inspire me, even though he is no longer with me. And whatever I do, I always try to do things the way maybe he would have liked me to do it. A man who understood the value of education, and in order to get me to learn to read and write, he turned a space in our house into a makeshift classroom, invited the boys from the neighborhood to come and do their homework there and to be tutored by a private teacher. And in the meantime, I too was taught to read, to write, and to decipher that magic of the alphabet. And because I was learning with boys who had two or three years ahead of me, and who already could read and write, I had a lot of catching up to do. And that also instilled in me that effort to compete, to catch up, to reach up to that person or people who were ahead of me. And that is how I learned to read and write. But then there are times when you think you cannot continue to teach a child in your little makeshift, makeshift school. So eventually, I was sent to neighboring Djibouti to go to school, where French became my first foreign language. Est-ce qu'il y a des Français ici aujourd'hui? 
Félicitations. Félicitations. Ça me rend vraiment plaisir de vous voir. That sense of competition, learning with boys, and learning going to school in a foreign country, honed in me, inspired me, encouraged me to develop a great passion for learning. Also, allowed me to see and watch how my father would deal with patients, the love and the dedication and the passion with which he served his people and served the sick. It taught me the value of compassion, of humility, and also taught me the value of duty to one's people and to those who are less privileged than you are. Now, education gave me an opportunity for an opportunity to win scholarship, compete for and win scholarships that sent me to Great Britain, where again, I was the only Somali female in London at that time. It's very hard to believe that, but there was a time I was the only female, and the, and the BBC would often invite me whenever they needed a female voice in their programs I would be that voice who would read the programs uh, in the Somali language. It also gave me a part-time job that was paying me more than nursing was. <laughs> and it was that education that gave me the opportunity to travel, to see the world, to find jobs that was so rare to come to an African girl at that time and to become the first Somali man or woman to win a position with the World Health Organization as an international civil servant. And over the years, I, I climbed that little ladder of uh, opportunity, of seniority, until 1991, when I became the WHO representative in the Republic of Djibouti a great honor for a Somali woman who was born and brought up in a country where there were no schools for girls. I served the United Nations until I retired in 97. And that is when I uh, put to practice that passion I had to return home and build a hospital. But before that, I'd like to talk to you about my visits to many countries, and particularly to the United States of America. And my first visit to this great country was in 1968, when my then husband, late husband, was the Prime Minister of Somalia, and we were hosted by President Lyndon Johnson on an official state visit. Now, during that visit, we were hosted in the White House. We lived in Blair House a very grand, very, very beautiful address where we were flown on Air Force One, yes. <laughs> and we were flown to Cape Canaveral, not far from here, where the first spaceship was being prepared to take man to the moon. Somewhere in a logbook, maybe on the moon or maybe on Cape Kennedy, there is a logbook with our signatures on it. What an honor. And those were grand days, the days when we would travel to countries and where my husband and his delegation would be met by heads of states. We would be met with 21 gun salutes and red carpets, Great days that were so grand and indeed moments that made us so proud to be representing the Somali people. But then little did I know then that the following year there would be a communist military coup that would kill the president, put my husband and his government in jail, put me under house arrest, take everything we had, and absolutely turned the country around to being, from being a democratic country to becoming a communist 
dictatorship. I survived that revolution with $83 to my name. But when released, after six months of house arrest, I had two choices. I could just spend the rest of my life moaning and groaning about what I had lost and what, what I had, or picking myself up and doing what I enjoy doing most, nursing and midwifery. Thank you. I was delivering from being the first lady of a country. I had to earn a living delivering women in their homes. And I had a little black bag where I would go to the house of the woman who was having a baby, and I would deliver her, and I would earn a living. Because that was what I enjoyed doing, and that was what I knew how to do. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, there is somebody in the audience today, a member of my family, my nephew, who I delivered on Christmas Day some 30, 40 years ago as a small premature baby, who today, that small premature baby, born in a country where we had no premature baby incubators, has grown up to become an, an engineer, and today is a pre-construction engineer in the United States of America. Now beat that. Now during those difficult years when the communists also labeled me, labeled me an anti-revolutionary, they would spend their time breaking into our house to search at odd hours of the night or day, looking for incriminating documents to prove that I was writing anti-revolutionary propaganda. They would take items from my house. I would be stopped in the streets. They would look at my delivery kit, which I had so meticulously sterilized, but who they would want to search. And I lived through that time with my head up because I was not going to give them the satisfaction to know that they had hurt me or they had humiliated me. <laughs> On an occasion, they sent me to a boot camp. Now, what better way to humiliate a former first lady than to send her to do four months of military service? Yes, I wore boots. Yes, I wore fatigues. Yes, I climbed dunes with packs on my back. But I'm a nurse. I'm used to walking. So. And they could not understand. They could not understand why I was not begging for mercy. Because for me, it was a new challenge. And four months of military service was really the best physical training I ever had. <laughs> now, five years later, they just gave up on me and gave me back my passport <laughs> and found somebody else to persecute, I guess. And with my passport in hand, I traveled. I have been to every continent of this world. I have probably been to most countries that you represent here today. I love the world. We live in a beautiful world. In such difficult circumstances, every country has something to offer, has something to give to others. And I've had the honor and the privilege to have visited many of your countries. I could have settled anywhere. The world was my oyster, but I refused to defect and each time I would return home and hopefully become that small fish that would attract bigger fish back to the country again. I still visit your countries, but my home is my home. 
is my country. I, I come here often. I come to the United States, student. In fact, in the audience, there would be Emma Fakia, a fellow student I share the accommodation with. At Boston University, I see your hand waving. Hello, Emma, who's today graduating with you. She was my roommate at Boston University. And then, of course, I travel to teach, I travel to learn, I travel to motiv motivate people like you. And I also travel on behalf of my country and on behalf of my people, either as a foreign minister or as an individual to defend certain causes that are very valuable to me, like fighting female genital mutilation, female genital cutting. And hopefully, some of you will find the time to join that effort because FGM has no place in this day and age. Nobody has the right to mutilate another human being. Now, my passion for teaching and for nursing continues. And that is what has let me build that hospital in Somaliland that President Kaplan just mentioned, and which has grown to become a referral hospital. We receive patients from all corners of the Horn of Africa. We receive patients who are rich. We receive patients who are poor. We receive patients, period. And we treat them the best way we can. And I was able to do that after I retired. And I just recycled my whole life, just sold everything I had, and went home and built a hospital on a site that was once, I'm sorry to say it, a killing ground and a garbage dump. But today, it's my home. I live there. If it's good enough for my patients, it has to be good enough for me, too. I travel to defend human rights. I travel to speak for the voiceless. I travel to try and share my life's experience to inspire people like you. Because fighting for what you believe in is what we're here for. And of course, now I have a university, the first university in the Horn of Africa conceived by a woman, an old woman, a retired old woman, <laughs> and which was at one time headed by another woman, but where we also have the honor to have both male and female students attending. Why not? <laughs> and you may want to know that um, in the middle of, construct of building the hospital, I ran out of funds. And there were a few items of jewelry I had put aside for a rainy day. And I sold them. And I used that money to buy the pipes, the wash basins, and the toilets for the hospital. So I use my, my jewelry several times a day now. <laughs> Why not? Thirteen years, the hospital has become a teaching hospital because teaching is really the gift that I wish to leave behind for my people. We train nurses, we train midwives, we train pharmacists, we train lab technicians, we train public health officers, we train dental technicians, and we also have started to train anesthesia, nurse anesthetists, on that site that was once a killing ground where I live. And only last week, we had 19 women who were flown in from neighboring Somalia, from Ogdisho, who were suffering from obstetrical fistula, who we repaired surgically, and who we sent home and who we treated free of charge. What an honor. 
Since we opened the hospital, we've delivered over 16,000 babies. We've lost 53 women. Many of them we could have saved. Many of those 53 women we could have saved had they been brought to us in good time. But it's still a quarter of the national average. The maternal mortality is a quarter of the national average. But we still try to save as many women as we can because no woman should die while giving life, giving birth to a child. And if Somaliland, a country that's not even on your map, can reduce maternal mortality to a quarter of the national average, many countries in the world could also learn from that example of Somaliland. And my hope and my dream is that one day we will have a thousand midwives for Somaliland and a million midwives for my continent, Africa. Make it happen, because we need it. Now, besides giving me a purpose in life, because when you retire and they find you redundant, to find something that you're passionate about gives you life. It also gives me a platform where I can influence education in my country, where I can encourage girls to go to school. And when I find somebody who hesitates and says, oh, but I'm only a girl, why should I go to school? My grandmother thinks I should stay at home. I often say to her, now do you think I would have built this hospital if it had not been for an education? Now imagine what you could do if you have that education. Now get up and go, you can do it. Try it out. Because I know once she steps into that circle of learning, she will become addicted, like I have become addicted to learning and teaching. And you may also want to know that two of the best surgeons I have working in my hospital started as nurses. And today, I sleep through the night. It's Dr. Shukri and Dr. Naima they call at night when there's an emergency. Girls who are brought up in refugee camps. Imagine that. That is the opportunity that education has given those little refugee girls to become surgeons and excellent doctors today. It can be done. And of course, today, my ambition is to allow my university to grow and hopefully partner with other great universities like Walden University that has so much to teach the world and from which we can learn so much back home in Somaliland. And if you think it's crazy for a woman to build a hospital and a university after retirement, boy, oh boy, do you know how many other ideas that are still kicking around in my head? <laughs> One of them is to, to start a teacher training program. Why not? Train the trainers, train the teachers, trickle down effect. That is the future of our people. Now that you have become equipped with education and you have acquired that degree that you have fought for for so long from Walden University, I hope that you too will find that spark that exists in everybody's heart and that you will put your achievements and your academic achievements to good use. I hope that you will find that cause that you feel very passionate about. And whenever you have obstacles and whenever you meet those who have doubts about your achievements and your capabilities, you will rise up to the occasion to prove to everybody that yes, you can do it. Your graduation today proves to all that you have the skills and you have the professional competence to succeed in exams. But this graduation also places a very important responsibility upon you because you need to show to all what 
you can do with that degree. And my advice to you is to set yourself goals. Never depend on others to keep climbing that ladder. Climb it with your own efforts. Go towards what you are aiming for with your own energy and your own efforts. Never fear failure because you will learn from it and you will become that much stronger from that experience. And of course, never, ever give up. Today, you have satisfied your teachers. Today, you have graduated from your respect respective courses. You have made your parents, your partners, your children, your grandchildren, and of course, Walden University proud. But your graduation is just the beginning. Because in you, I see more than a graduation. I see ambition. I see determination. I see hope. I see success. I see the future. So find your dream. Set yourself goals. And ladies and gentlemen, go for it. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you.